my name's Justine Clark and I'm uh, from Parlour, but I'm also tonight uh, representing Monash University um, uh, on behalf of my colleague Naomi Stead. Naomi can't be with us tonight. So um, Monash is the host, the virtual host of the salon. Uh, as always, of course, we'd like to begin with an acknowledgement of country to acknowledge the people of the greater Kulin nations who are the traditional custodians of the land that Monash University is on. But of course, we're all joining from um, all across Australia, across the many nations of Australia. And indeed, I'm very pleased we've got some people with us internationally. So we also acknowledge the traditional custodians of country all across Australia is the many nations and we recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. And we extend that, that um, respect and well, uh, to Indigenous Australians and other Indigenous peoples who are part of the Parla community and with us tonight. So um, I am now really just going to hand straight over to Alison McFadgen who is um, my uh, colleague who has done, done a huge amount of work with um, helping us set up the salons and particularly these um, online salons with Emma Healy. So um, Ali is going to um, introduce the event tonight. Go Ali. Thank you, Justine. Hello everyone and welcome to our second online parlor salon. So the entire salon program is possibly be possible because of our support from AWS, our parlor partner, and we really value their support, so thank you. With the salons, we wanted to establish a welcoming and fairly informal environment for people to get together. And the idea of the conversation um, and exchange is also the format for these events. So we simply invite these two wonderful women to interview each other, or an instance of tonight, maybe more of a storytelling exercise. We also have had some fantastic conversations so far, so I'm really looking forward to what we hear tonight between Carly and Lalata. Then it's over to you. We, we're we gonna open up the breakout rooms as part of Zoom, where we hope you meet some new people and exchange stories and simply enjoy each other's company. We'll be shuffling these every 15 minutes. So um, you get to meet a mix of people and we'll just flag, please bear with us if there's any technical glitches, because we're still getting used to the format. And now I'll hand over to Emma, who's going to introduce uh, the speakers tonight. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks, Ali. Um, so I'm really excited to hear from Melissa and Carly tonight. They're people who I call friends, and I think they think of me as a friend too, not sure, hopefully. <laughs> Um, I met Lawada at uni and we worked together on the Thakandrove Women's Resource Centre in Savu Savu. And uh, Lawata is of Itaukai descent, so she's Indigenous Fijian, but she's worked across Australia and studied in Australia. So I'm really interested in um, both these speakers because they have cross-cultural um, experiences that are really interesting. Um, Lawada is currently studying at the uni or researcher at the University of Canberra where her research focuses on the intersection of architecture with women's cultural knowledge. And Carly is Australian born but of British descent and has spent quite a bit of time in Ahmedabad in India as a teacher and um, are you laughing at my pronunciation? No, Carly? I tried that was to... great. Well done. I was, <laughs> I was smiling because you did a good job. <laughs> um, so she is almost finished her PhD, very close to finishing her PhD, which explores the significance of public spaces in informal settlements in India. So I'm um, very grateful to Carly for showing up when you're in the midst of um, all of that. So thank you both for being here. So over to you. Oh, one more thing, sorry. Um, if people have questions um, and they want to type them into the chat box as they think of them, I'll um, pick out a few at the end to ask Carly and Lawada. Can yeah. I also just say something about the sound? We hope we really, um, we really love to have you all visible if possible. So keep your cameras on if you can. But if we're having trouble with the sound, the first thing to do is if everyone can just turn their camera off, except Carly and Lawada, of <laughs> course, who we want to see. Um, because we found last time that that, that really did help um, improve the sound quality. Um, and if we end up 
uh, with it being particularly poor, we will um, interrupt and arrange a shift of phones. But um, first thing, if it gets a bit noise, if it gets a bit hard to hear, um, turn off your turn off your video. So, sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Kelly right, and Luata. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone, for asking us to be here and, and introducing us. Um, and I'm and thank you also for pairing me with Loata. It's been so lovely to get to know you just a little bit. Um, and not only because you're lovely and interesting, but um, it's been really fantastic to see how our kind of varied architectural experience really aligns over practice and volunteering and research. Um, and how architecture has kind of really impacted our lives in quite a deep way. Um, so I'm really excited that we're going to share some stories with you tonight, with all of you, the collective you, um, that illustrate some of those really important moments um, in our experience. So I might start um, by asking Loata if you could share with us your story, um, what you're working on at the moment, and how you came to be doing research in architecture. <sighs> Okay, hello everyone. Bulovi um, Naka and hello to everyone. Um, thank you, uh, Paula and friends, for having me participate in your online salon series. I'm a bit nervous. Um, thank you, Emma, for the introduction and Kali. Uh, I feel so privileged for sharing this space with you, Kali, and so sharing our narrative, our work, and our experiences. Um, uh, my story and my current work are all interrelated, and it's situated in my uh, in Fiji the country of my birth. Um, before I, uh, I'm not sure whether many of you know Fiji, so I just thought, okay, um, because we don't have much time, so it's just, um, to cut it short, I just thought, okay, let's, since we are architects, we talk about the logistics of things. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> traveling from Sydney to Fiji, it takes about three and, and uh, to four hours flight from Sydney. As soon as you get there, you're greeted with uh, sunshine, beautiful sunshine all year round. The ukulele at the airport, smiling faces, and the relaxing uh, Fiji music, which is my favorite. Uh, and then I take, you could either take a half hour flight to the Fiji's capital, which is Suva, or you catch a, 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 a three and a half hour scenic uh, trip to uh, Suva uh, with a beautiful coastal views. So um, these are some of the things that when I get to Fiji is some of the things that I appreciate uh, because uh, like uh, Kali and I we were talking about and all the things that we miss about uh, uh, our, uh, our love for the ocean. And that's uh, something that I miss living in Sydney. I miss the ocean, the smell of the breezes, the, the winds, and also the smiling faces from my um, from uh, people, especially from family members. So these are some of the things that I look forward to. A bit about myself. Uh, I grew up in rural Fiji uh, in the 70s with my maternal extended family, completing primary and secondary uh, education in uh, Taviuni. It's uh, uh, most often called the Garden Island of Fiji, only leaving the island to attend tertiary studies in Suva, the Fiji's capital. So even though I spent more than a decade in Sydney, I'm still an island rural Fijian girl at heart. Um, so uh, most of most of the time, uh, I, I guess my uh, traveling back and forth to Fiji, it's kind of Fiji keeps drawing me back home uh, every, every time. So um, I'm always wanting to go back uh, um, to my island home, which is uh, you, uh, from the main Viti level, uh, Suva. There's a, a bit of island hopping to get to Taviuni. So my work is, all, is, is situated on uh, uh, where my uh, home is, which is Taviuni. And um, uh, when we started the project um, in 2008 um, with uh, my colleagues, uh, Emma and Lucia, um, one of the things that we wanted was to experience the travel from, um, from how the women would travel to the islands. So that's, uh, that's uh, just so that we can experience the experiences. So this is something that, uh, I like to do is actually do island hopping. Either I go on a 12 hour ferry trip or I go uh, 10 hour by ferry, bus, ferry, bus. So it's a lot of traveling time. Uh, so the logistic, there's a lot of logistics to get to, to the island where I'm from and also where the project is located. Um, I don't want to overwhelm anyone, so I'll just keep it brief. 
And if you have any further questions, you can uh, just ask me when we go to our room. Um, for some of you who might be thinking, um, uh, curious to know uh, my professional background. So I started in the construction industry in 1992, and um, I moved for the first time to Australia in 97 to study architecture in Queensland. And uh, I've worked in engineering and architectural practices. And uh, after graduation, I spent uh, three uh, very uh, great years in, in Sydney, working in architectural practices in Sydney uh, before, uh, before I became a full-time mom in 2012. The, I guess the highlight of my current work is actually um, developing the women's project in my own community, which uh, started in 2007 in my own local community. So 2008, uh, I was a volunteer with Architects Without Frontiers, including my colleagues as well. And um, 2015, I became the project uh, coordinator. So I was volunteering as well as a coordinator, a cultural advisor, as well as a local consultant for this uh, women's project in Fiji. Um, 2016, I decided to join a local architectural firm in uh, Fiji, just to keep an eye on the women's project while it was uh, under development. So um, I'm always surrounded with this, with the women's project. I'm, I'm always keeping an eye on it to just make sure that it's moving. So um, the project actually frames my current work today, which is my research. And um, 2015 uh, made me realize that I had so many questions that I wanted to answer, so many questions. Uh, so many things that I didn't understand on, uh, about my culture as well as how to kind of find the balance between uh, my culture as well as driving a project within that context. Uh, my research thesis is framed around the women's project and its ongoing development. So I'm, in, I'm examining indigenous women's knowledge and the spaces they inhabit in the indigenous Fijian context. There's a bit of layering in my research, which I can cover later. And uh, I think that uh, that's covers briefly <laughs> who I am. And I hope some of you are my, a, a bit, uh, uh, I mean, kind of get to know me now. And um, maybe Kali, uh, I mean, you might want to share something about uh, your journey and uh, what's the story, your story. Yeah, thank you. Um, that's such a beautiful story. And I, in some ways, um, although it, my, my story is quite different, it overlaps and parallels in really important kind of moments. I guess um, I'll start where I'm at now and work backwards. But um, at the moment, I'm re researching informal settlements in India. Um, and as Emma said, I'm working in a city called Amnabad, which is the largest in the state of Gujarat. And that's in the northwest um, of India, bordering Pakistan. Um, Amnabad is home to about 8 million people um, and approximately 728,000 people live in informal settlements, um, which I was looking at Australian populations and it's about uh, twice the size of Newcastle or the Sunshine Coast to kind of put it into perspective. I've, I find it really hard to visualise numbers a lot of the time. <laughs> um, so informal settlements, um, if you haven't heard that uh, kind of term before, um, are places where most buildings are constructed by residents on, on themselves on land that's not formally owned by those residents. Um, and so I'm looking at the origins and significance of housing typologies and settlement patterns in those two in, in two informal settlements. Um, so that means that I'm documenting the built environment, um, I'm looking for spatial patterns, and I'm observing how people use public spaces and places around the home, and then interviewing people to understand the processes of um, incremental construction that they've been through to build their house and what it means to them. So um, that's kind of similar to your research in a sense. I'm also mo mainly working with women. Um, and I was first introduced to informal settlements in Amnabad through working for the Anganwadi project, which is also affiliated with Architects Without Frontiers. Um, and I was also a volunteer with my colleague Nini and we designed and built a preschool over there in, in 2016. Um, and so I worked there for six months 
and um, observed that the built environment was affording some really, really important social relationships. But just as you said, Loata, I also had all of these questions that I just couldn't answer through practice. Um, and I also noticed that outsiders to the informal settlement didn't think that it had any value. So those questions really um, founded, I suppose, my research project. And I guess um, I, I had to go through that process of transitioning from architect to researcher, um, but I was always an outsider to the community. Um, whereas Loata, you, you were always um, an insider. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about those positions that you've had within the community. So you've kind of gone from family member to volunteer, to architect, to researcher. How, how has that changed your practice and, and how has it changed you? Oh, how has it changed me? Yeah. Uh, um, I guess uh, it's changed me a lot in the way I, uh, I see things, in the way I observe. Um, and also it's, it's, it's made me appreciate um, the, the, the women because I think as an architect, we have clients, right? But as, uh, as, uh, as we work with communities, the, the, we, sometimes we have this confusion between who is the client? Is the client the aid who provides the money or is the client the beneficiary? Who is going to be the user? So I, I, I find myself struggling with those, those two because for me, it just so, it's so simple. It's an infrastructure. The user is the client, even though they're not the one bringing the money in, they're the ones who's going to be using the space. So I guess uh, my interest in the processes of it, uh, also trying to define what sort of position that I need to occupy within the spaces that I'm working within. And so these spaces, I realized that um, it was complex. Uh, you, you, were not, you, you, you were not just the architect, you were the facilitator. You are the cultural uh, interme uh, intermediary. And th this is one thing that I love about architecture because architecture, you can encompass all these different layers and then you, you can kind of, because just like we visualize a project, we also can visualize these positions that we can occupy. Mm -hmm. Because you, we have to understand that when we are uh, consulting with different communities, you are consulting with a different sort of, um, mannerisms, uh, the language, uh, the language you use, you know, all these things are important because when we talk about collaboration, consultation, and, and, and then you, you're not understanding the context you're working within, then how can you, how do you define that? And especially in the Fijian context, in the indigenous women's context, when we're working with indigenous women, especially Fijian women, uh, there's hierarchical structure there. And there's, 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 there's the paternalistic uh, framework that uh, underpins. And then there's religion and all, all this stuff. And for women, we, we are not always, uh, I'm not sure how to say this, but for us women, for indigenous Fijian women, we always um, take the supportive role. We always put it every, and then we become the, the last uh, thing. So, so it's like when we do designing, um, developing a women's project we need to understand all these positionings not only our own positionings but the positionings of the people who will be using the spaces that we are designing for and then how they would be designing this how would you design the spaces for these these women uh, and one of the things one of the experiences that i got is um, it's so easy for organizations or to just say okay let's just take this template and just put it there but they don't, not realizing that the templates need to be um, adopted and adapted to suit, suit the context, especially uh, the user. So I think two of the things that uh, was important for me was, was like, I was the insider, like you said, but also I felt like an outsider as well because of my professional positioning, uh, my education, um, I was no longer accepted as being one of them. So there was this, uh, I needed to find that position. I, I needed to find the position so that 
I'm able to engage with the community. And um, uh, that's the reason why my interest within um, the insider, the outsider, and there's the in-between, which I call that the neutral space that we have to find, that neutral space. When we're working within these communities, you have to find that neutral space where we can observe and appreciate and share and, and, and just participate uh, with the community at hand. And I'm sure, Kali, you've had these experiences before and within the uh, informal settlements, because I can see you, you have, you're nodding. Yeah. And this is what <laughs> excites me because, because I'm talking about a context, an indigenous context, and then you work within your context in India. And it seems like most of the time when we're talking, we're always, you know, <laughs> yeah. agreeing with Yeah, it. it's remarkably similar. So, because we've got all these complex spaces that we are working within and and then we're trying to um i i'm, I'm still trying to find uh, a suitable position for me because as an indigenous woman when i go into my community to do research or to do work i'm always not looked at as an architect i'm always looked at as a woman and i'm always looked at as a daughter or i'm always looked at as a sister you know, oh, you're a sister, you know, uh, go and have a look yourself, you know, and, and, and it's, it's very hard sometimes, but I guess that's the challenge and I like it. <laughs> yeah. So does that mean that people um, are not as willing to share with you as, as an architect when you're trying to kind of understand from their perspective what they need from the project? They're not as willing to kind of give you that information? Um. I, I guess it, oh, I don't know. I, I just I just feel like um, it's not about not giving that information. It's just it's about like you have this this position that mm -hmm. that people perceive because um, uh, as an architect, even me, I I, I was really uh, I didn't feel good when I said, tell people that I was doing architecture. I, I felt really, you know, insecure that, that to say I, I was doing architecture because it mm -hmm. just felt that I'm not supposed to be in that space. Mm -hmm. So, so um, maybe, maybe when you, when, when we were driving the project, you know, like we were saying, oh, three girls are driving the project and this is a Fijian context. I mean, you hardly see a lot of uh, female architects, mm -hmm. you know, and, and these three girls are, are, are trying to drive um, a woman's project. And that's even uh, worse because it's a woman's project. And, and you know, uh, what about, there's a question that goes there is, okay, if it's the women's project, what about us? But the, but the thing is, you know, it, it's, uh, it's really, uh, yeah, it's complex. I think. Yeah, and we've talked a little bit about, um, I guess, transferring ownership as part of that design process um, and trying to make that space that you said was kind of a little bit strange in that context, allow the, the women who were going to use it to take ownership over it. How, how did you try to go about doing that? I think the ownership process doesn't come after the women gain the project. It has to come prior, you know, yeah. in the process. Yeah. It's, it's through the process. Uh, like for instance, when we started the project, we used to meet up with the women and uh, and some of them <laughs> i used to observe them is is you know their faces is, is oh what are they going to do with this stuff you know you know nothing's going to come out of it or something but then we kept moving forward you know that's the thing we kept moving forward and allowing them to be part of that process as they allowed them to uh, before when we started the project um, we'd ask a question and there was no answer because mm. Fiji is a culture of silence for, for women we're we part of we we listen we are listeners mm. that's what we are we are listeners so so even trying to get them to engage there, there was not much conversation you know that discussion but today if, if we talk about something and we want their feed their engagement in the process they will speak up now um, really so, that's amazing yeah, because to you only or to everybody um because now like like one thing with the with the women's project it's given the women a space where they can come and and find ownership in it mm -hmm. like you said ownership uh, each process like the the how they got the prop the land that was part of that ownership uh when they when they got um uh, agreement from the the indigenous community that was one milestone 
And then the next milestone was when, when they became invited to be present in other forums, like uh, to be um, uh, community uh, advisors in, in a government body or things like that. So that those are, then they started getting those sorts of invitations. So, so these were some little forms of steps of uh, ownership. But then as it grew, and then once the infrastructure stood there, we had a bit of, uh, we were scared that when the infrastructure came on and uh, they won't be able to take uh, capacity over there. But it just kind of like transitioned, uh, transitioned uh, to that. And now they are running it and driving the, it themselves. Mm. And were there any contestations over that space? Did other people try to come into that space or was it safe for the women to, to kind of own it, I suppose? I think it's uh, it's safe. Uh, I, I think uh, it's safe for them. Um, I guess. I guess I, I look at when when I say when I say safe, I, I I see them as making use of the space as it's theirs, you know. Mm. Um, and uh, for now, I mean, they've just been uh, operating for two two years now in the in the space. Um, hopefully. Um, uh, they, they've, they've got so many ideas now <laughs> on what they want to do, uh, yeah, you know, so, uh, yeah. What about, what about India? Like, what, what, did you find the same, um, you know, like with the projects that you were working on, like, were there, uh, you know, um, content, like you were saying, were there problems with, uh, with the other uh, communities because you're working with the women? Yeah, um, it, it really depended on, um, on what the project was. The, the Anganwadi project um, is a government, it's a government, it's a, it's a preschool, so it, and it's a government supported um, project and um, children are very uh, sacred in India. And so that, that project was um, uh, a little smoother in that sense because it was already operating, they just needed a space. Um, it was a little tricky sometimes talking to the builders because they weren't really used to um, taking directions from women all the time. But most of the time, um, you know, with a laugh or a joke or something, we could kind of, the Gujaratis have a very good sense of humour, so we could kind of make it through. Um, but the things that were a little trickier were probably, um, uh, as, as you were saying, the kind of... Um, the way that your position changes and the kind of project that you're working on, that can really um, change things. Um, I think you've frozen, are you still there? Or am I frozen? No, maybe it's just Loata. Are you there Loata? We lost you. We've lost her. We'll call her. Well, uh, she last time I spoke to her, she had an internet problem, but she was able to come back in. But um, I'll tell a story um, about uh, a project that um, I guess you could see as a failure, but I think of it as, as a success. Um, so I'll explain why. But um, to to kind of set the scene, I guess um, doing doing research is is quite different to to being an architect. I guess um, it. The architectural process you all know quite well um, but with my research project I'll give you an idea of a typical day and then I'll tell you about this particular incident that that happened so a typical day um, so I spent about six months um, in India doing my field work and um, I stayed at volunteer accommodation with Manav Sadna the a local NGO that runs the preschools that that we built and also some community centers and part of my research was always um, about giving back to the community as the first thing that I needed to do. So um, when I first arrived, I kind of um, asked Manav Sadna about where I was needed. And I really took the cues from, um, from them, from, from the communities that needed me or, and from the children as well. So I ended up um, teaching art at a community centre. Um, so a typical day was kind of to wake up in the morning. Um, I lived with four girls in my volunteer house. So we'd have breakfast and then whoever was going out to the community centre would all meet at about eight or so in the morning. Um, and we'd grab a rickshaw up to the north of the city where this particular settlement was. Um, so we'd take the rickshaw and I guess um, 
India really, when I think about India, it's colors of this burning kind of red color and a burnt orange. Um, and then these pops of really bright colors like the bright yellow of the rickshaw and um, bright blue of a sari or something like that. So we kind of, we travel in the rickshaw, um, arrive across the road from the settlement. Um, and in between me and the settlement is a six lane highway which I have to try and cross. And I don't know if anyone has been to India, but uh, um, the cars don't stop for you. And in Ahmedabad, they don't even stop at red lights sometimes. So, so hopefully there's someone there and I can kind of join in them or I've got other people with me and we can walk across the road as a pack. Um, so we take, we get the first, so there's a break in the traffic and you kind of walk slowly, methodically across to the median and then you get to the next stage. And then the settlement itself, there's kind of a row of formal buildings along the road of um, houses and shop fronts and things. And then as you move into the settlement, it becomes more and more informal as you go. So some of the land is owned um, privately, some publicly by the city and some by the state. Um, and the community centre is about a 10 minute walk right at the back of the settlement that's continually expanding towards the river. Um, and as I get closer to the, to the community centre, there's... Um, lots of shouts of Kali Didi, Kali Didi, which means Kali sister um, from the kids. And then they start popping out and then they join me and we all walk to the community center together. Um, and then uh, the community center goes from about 8.30 to 11. And um, we start with an all religion prayer um, and meeting. And then we have an hour for lessons and I teach that it's grades one to five. So I teach one of those classes um, art each day. And then um, we'd have a little wrap up meeting with the teachers. We'd send the kids home with a nutritious snack. And then after um, working at the community center, I would often go to a preschool nearby and just help out, help them make food or do craft activities, that kind of thing. Um, and in between, I'd take observations of how people were using public spaces um, and, and, and spaces in and around the home. Uh, and then on my way back, I would usually take a different route throughout the settlement each time so that I could map it. Um, and I had, when I got home, I had a kind of a digital plan of the settlement and I would start filling it in about where, which route I took and where the shops were and, and that kind of thing. Um, and I would take down my field notes and um, uh, file all my photographs and, and that kind of thing. Um, and it was, and I guess it's, it's really exhausting because you never get the opportunity to kind of switch off. Um, and so I, I was there, I did field work um, in three different sessions. Um, and this, the second session um, went for three and a half months. And in about three months in, I was able to do some interviews and I interviewed about 12 women living in the settlement. And I had a translator um, who was a, a young architecture student, a, a woman, um, and she would come with me and we'd do interviews with women. Um, and so the women elected to speak with me um, and, and most of them I'd built up a really strong relationship over the, over the period that I'd been there, which was about five months at that point over two different trips. Um, and it was amazing because it was the first time I'd actually gotten to speak to them in depth because my Gujarati isn't that good. Um, and I could never really ask them their opinions. So that was a really, um, a really powerful thing to share with them. And through the course of doing interviews, um, I learned that a lot of the women that I knew um, and that were associated with the community center um, actually didn't have a toilet. And you can imagine how devastating that is for, for someone's life. Um, and so at this point, I, I'd been there, I was really tired and, I, and the architect kind of in me kicked in and I was like, I can do this. I can, I can get them a toilet. And I kind of looked at, and I was, I'd got about two and a half weeks left or three weeks left. And so I thought, oh, I've got, I've, I don't have enough money to build everyone a toilet, obviously, um, but I could probably do one. And they didn't have one. Most of these women worked as um, rag pickers, which means that they collect trash from the street. Um, uh, and then they sort it and they sell it to recycling centers for, for money. And they earn a few dollars every day. And that's how they kind of feed their families. Um, and so I thought, oh, well, they don't have a bathroom at the community center that's just for them. So maybe I could create one, um, that they could share. 
so I talked to the NGO about this and they were kind of like, well, yeah, if you want to go, go ahead. Um, so they, they kind of gave me the go ahead. Uh, and then I chatted to my friends who were volunteering as well. Um, and they said that they would help me out. Um, so one of them was American, but she had parents who were born in Ahmedabad, so she could speak Gujarati. So we met with the women on um, a Saturday and I've, yeah, I've got about two and a half weeks left at this point um, and shared with them the idea, kind of got to know them, um, shared the, the idea of creating a toilet for them. Most of them didn't have a toilet um, and they were all like, yes, that, you know, we want that. That's a really good idea. Um, and then we kind of went through some of the problems that might happen. So um, how do we keep it clean, maintenance? So we said, okay, we'll create a cleaning schedule. Um, and then, well, what, how do we make sure that other people don't come in throughout the night and that kind of thing? So we said, okay, we'll, we'll have a key and only the women who you know, work at this place and, and use the bathroom will have a key. And so, okay, great, awesome. We're gonna, we're gonna get this project going. Um, and then the week later, we met again on a Saturday um, and my friend Aisha, who was translating, um, and my friend Stephanie from New Zealand were there. Stephanie's a yoga teacher. She teaches kids um, yoga. And so we, we sat down, um, we were talking about the project, and, and suddenly they were kind of, um, they really, they were kind of negative about it. And I was like, what, what is going on? What's happened? You know, they, they need a toilet and, and it seems pretty straightforward and we've solved the problems. So I said to Aisha, can you ask them, you know, why, why this is happening? Why they feel like this? Um, what, what's kind of going on underneath the surface of, of what they're saying? And so she talked to them for a little while and then she translated back and she said, well, they were talking about it over the week and they thought that, if they had a space that was just theirs, just for the women, that the men in their lives, their husbands and brothers and uncles, wouldn't like it, that they had a space that only they could, um, only they could use. And if they had this key and they had this space, the men would take it from them. Uh, and if the men started using it, then it would destroy the, the safety of that space. And if they didn't give them the key, they would probably be beaten or they would incur some kind of violence um, because of that. And it's a very emotional story because I was just devastated. It didn't, I had, I had so many feelings, my stomach just kind of dropped out of my, out of my body. It was um, awful to, to think that this could happen to them. And so I kind of, said immediately well well we won't we won't do this project we'll just stop it and then I I asked Stephanie to take over the, the session we still had about half an hour left and do some yoga um and then I excused myself and had a huge cry um in a corner away from everyone because I'll try to explain how I was feeling but um I guess I was feeling so upset that this is reality of their lives um I was feeling so ashamed and naive that I hadn't ever thought that this could happen and ashamed that I was putting forward a, a solution that actually made their, their lives worse. Um, but also a little bit proud that I hadn't let any kind of ego um, kind of come into play and that as soon as I realized that that project could have done harm, I stopped it straight away. And then, so all of these feelings are kind of swelling around and I'm exhausted from all of the field work. Um, and then I just said to myself, this is ridiculous. You can't be here crying. Just pull yourself together and get back in there. So I did, um, but you could tell I was upset and we did the rest of the yoga class and I was like, okay, okay, it's all okay. And then after the, after the, the session, the, the women all came up to me in this big circle and they can't speak any English. And they said, sorry, sorry, Kali Didi. And I was just completely bewildered. Like, why were they apologizing to me? So I asked Aisha, what, what, why are they apologizing? What's happening? And Aisha translated back and she said, oh, they, they wanted to say sorry that you couldn't do your project. Mm -hmm. 
and I was just devastated again because this wasn't a this wasn't my project it wasn't about it wasn't about me and I tried to explain through Asia um, through translation that I was upset because I could have caused harm and they were really confused by that which just totally set me off again because I realized that they are never really treated with any empathy so I'm kind of crying they're looking at me like what is this weirdo doing like honestly who what <laughs> and my friends are kind of like mate you need to go home you're way too tired to do this <laughs> but anyway um this might seem like a really trivial trivial story but um it was a really important moment that um i think kind of encapsulates the transition that you i made from architect to researcher in that you know um buildings are never just physical objects they are embedded with um social and cultural meaning um there are there are hierarchies of power at play um and sometimes a building is not the right thing to do um and i guess i think of it as a success story because you, you might well think of it as a failure but i think of it as, as a success story because um i trusted them it's kind of a mark of our relationship i trusted them to tell me um what they needed or what they didn't need in this case. And they trusted me not to abuse that um, situation. So I guess that's a, a kind of story about um, how those positions kind of change. Um, and in, in contrast to, similar to Lawata's, but in contrast as an outsider and kind of doing that through translation and kind of a lot of the time realizing that everyone thought I was a total weirdo, but um, kind of <laughs> going with it and making jokes about it and kind of being okay with that. Um, has Lawata made it back? Yes, yes. back. <laughs> back. Sorry, Tali. I was just wanting to uh, um, um, just ask you a question. Uh, with your experience, like, um, was there any, like, I mean, like you said, you know, the toilet is very important because there was no toilets there. So was there any suggestion that maybe a dialogue between the men and the women, is that a possibility or is that something that doesn't happen? It's something that I spoke to the NGO staff about a lot. Um, it wasn't my place. I couldn't, as a particularly, well, as a woman and then as a foreign woman, um, I couldn't really speak to the men. Um, there are a few men that I had relationships, like friendships with, I suppose, and obviously the community centre staff, but it was very inappropriate for me to try and engage with them. And I did talk a lot to the NGO staff about the importance of um, those kinds of cultural shifts and, and kind of training for men not to abuse people. Um, but that wasn't really a place that I could kind of go. Um, and, the, and the people that I was working with, it was a very bottom up approach with um, children and women. Um, so I didn't, I didn't do any kind of top down thing. It was all bottom up. Mm. Mm. I think maybe we've well, reached our, uh, um, Oh, half an hour. Oh, did you have another question? Oh, we are close to time. We're over time a little bit, but um, I think it would be good if if there was something more the water wanted to end on um, before we ask the people. <laughs> Your story. Hey. Oh, are we? Have we run out of time? <laughs> well, maybe maybe we could leave with um, just a really quick takeaway um Loata, if you have any takeaways at the moment that you'd like to leave everyone with um from your research just to wrap up oh, okay mm -hmm. Uh, just just to wrap up, it's just uh, I guess as a, as um, someone who works with the community and and, and uh, hearing from what Kali's uh, experiences, um, I guess uh, um, working um, with there are underlying issues um, and also the underlying issues uh, do undermine uh, women's uh, development within. Uh, um, some uh, context, and especially in the Indigenous Fijian context, 
And I think one of the things that I found, even though I was working on this nice uh, cultural center, I realized that there are some things uh, that are important. I think that's what changed me when I went into the village and realized that um, when we talk about uh, women, we always seem to be talking about uh, women's empowerment, but we, 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 we kind of uh, sometimes forget that we need to uh, look at their well-being, and, and their well-being is their, is their homes, their built environment. And, 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 and like the, for the Thailand incident uh, in, in the Fijian culture, uh, when I went into the village for the first time, one of the things that they told me in the mornings, when you get up, don't go to the toilet because if you, if you stand on the, um, you know how, how morning dew, morning dew on the grass, yeah. and most of the toilets are just a few meters away from the, the main home. Eh? So they told me, make sure you don't walk on the grass because that's bad luck, you know? And then I'm thinking to myself, oh my goodness. So if it's bad luck for me to just step on the morning dew so I can go to the toilet, then where do I go? <laughs> <laughs> so again, you know, there's the belief system, you know, and, and the funny thing was, uh, when I was working on the CWRC project, I, I did a bit of a design before I went into the village. And then that's before I heard that story. And then I designed the toilet outside from the main building. Mm. And then when I went into the village and then they said that, you know, you can't step on the morning dew to go to the toilet. And I'm thinking, oh, goodness. Um, so it's the belief system also uh, that uh, these are underlying issues, you know, a belief system also that we have to take into consideration. And one of the things is, especially for the elderly, eh? the elderly, uh, these are, um, so that's why I, I think like what Kali is saying, the toilets are very important. And, and sometimes I might not be designing a big fancy building, but um, if I design a toilet, at least it's it's kind of it's uh, it's kind of uh, uplifting a women's uh, well-being. I just want to leave that mm -hmm. with everyone. Just when if you think that there's no project that you can do, maybe a toilet might <laughs> be <laughs> the thing that you might consider to yeah. <laughs> help uh, a household in in one uh, community that you might visit. I think that that would be the the biggest help uh, for any household. I, I would think. You know, we think of it as a basic building typology, but it sounds pretty complex yeah. um, in cross-cultural situations. Um, we, um, we have time for some questions before we go to the breakout rooms. Um, I have lots of questions, but I will, um, there's a few, I think there's a few in the um, comments. Um, Nachal, is that how I say your name? Nature. Nature, sorry. That's okay. Um, had a question for Kali. Did you want to put that to Kali yourself? Yeah, sure. Thanks a lot for the opportunity. Ma'am, this is a really good research. It was really nice to hear about your research in Ahmedabad. I'm curious to know about if your research includes development of slums. Is it different from the informal settlements that you are talking about? and also, how, according to you, these settlements are getting affected by the pandemic, how their development is being influenced or will be influenced by the whole pandemic situation, if you could elaborate on that. Oh, thank you, Nechal, for those questions. Um, yes, that's a really important question about slums um, versus informal settlements. Um, in India, the, the, the areas that I'm working in are, labeled, are categorized as slums, um, but I have a few problems with the term slum because of the negative baggage that it has. So I choose to use the word informal settlement, but um, a lot of people do use them interchangeably. Um, slums are defined by what they lack, whereas I'm trying to find the inherently good stuff about the place um, and use that as as a way to um, improve quality of life. So informal settlement just means that um, the the land isn't formally owned. Um, so it's it's still it's still problematic for a lot of boring academic reasons. But um, it it's a little bit less baggagey than than slum. So that's that's that part of the question. Um, the pandemic, yeah, I it it 
can potentially be absolutely devastating. And I was a bit um, panicked, I suppose, when I when I first heard about it um, going through India. Um, the local NGO that I was working with, Manav Sadna, has been doing an incredible job um, at providing food because a lot of the people that live there um, that I was working with are daily wage earners, which means that everything that they earn that day is how much food they can put on the table. So, of course, when India went into lockdown and they're not allowed to move and leave their house, um, that's obviously really problematic um, for a lot of people. And a lot of people were saying that, you know, they might die of starvation rather than um, actually the pandemic. Um, the friends that have um, internet on their phones, I've been in touch with and they're all okay. So that's really great. Um, and there are really amazing people um, supporting on the ground. But other than that, I'm not sure um, how everyone is. But thank you for your questions. Thanks a lot, ma'am. Thank you. Thanks, Carly. Thank you, Nigel. Um, I also was wondering, there's a question here from Rutu. Is that the right pronunciation? Yes, Rutu. Did you want to ask a question? I thought maybe Lawada might be interested in answering this one. If you want to ask it, ask it to Lawada yourself, Rutu. You'll have to unmute yourself. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hi, Kylie, and hi, uh, Lawada. I hope I'm pronouncing it correct. Um, I just um, recently have uh, had a research uh, paper in my curriculum on indigenous construction. So I researched that most of them are not aware as an architect um, or an, as an architecture student. So I was thinking like, uh, do you think it's important to have it in a curriculum and as a profession that um, like you have a project related to the community development. Did you get that? Oh, is Lawaza gone? She looks frozen. Oh no, she's there. Did she's you there, get I that think. question, Lawata? <laughs> I don't know if she can hear. Maybe not. Was it was it a question for me? Um, I think you could answer it <laughs> if you wanted to. <laughs> Did you get it or not really? It was around whether um, whether there should be more awareness of community indigenous development in curriculums and as a profession. Nivalawata. What do you think, Carly? <laughs> <laughs> um, short answer, yes. <laughs> Long answer um, is a little bit more complicated. I think it's really important that um, people who've been oppressed or marginalised don't exist for us to experiment on. Um, and I think it's really important as a professional that you, you treat that job in exactly the same way that you would any other client. Um, it can be really tempting, I think, for students um, to kind of want to build their experience quickly and see some of those contexts as a way to do that. Um, but unless they are being supported by a professional, it's really inappropriate and you can cause a lot of harm. Um, but short answer, yes, I think it's really important um, for us to learn about lots of different ways of being and lots of different architecture. Um, yeah. Um, thank you, Carly. Lawada's having trouble getting back on, so I might try and help her, but I did have a question for you. Sure. Um, I just wondered if you had any tips for people generally who are working in cultures outside of their own that they're not familiar with, like a bit of a, a guideline or... Yeah. Um, well, I think the most important thing is the relationship that you build. And in architecture, there's a lot of focus on um, the building as an object, this beautiful, shiny, finished object. Um, but 
in in this kind of work, I actually don't think that that's very important, um, and it's the least important part of, of of it all. And the most important part is the relationship, and that takes a lot of time, and it takes a lot of respect. Um, and like my my uh, toilet story, it it takes the kind of you need to listen to the things that aren't being said, I suppose, and and it's kind of empathy, I guess. There's, there's not really any way um, that you can be prepared for cultural difference in every setting. Um, there's no book. There's, you could read all the books in the world and it would still, there'd still be a situation on the ground that is unexpected and you don't know how to deal with it. So I think if you start from a position of building trust um, in those relationships and listening to people and believing them when they say things, you know, you might think it's silly, but it actually doesn't matter. You have to believe um, what they're saying. So that would be my my biggest piece of advice, I suppose. Right. I think um, the word is in and out. Um, should we, just having trouble connecting. Um, should we go to breakout rooms, Justine? And I'll, or should I try and give her a call on the phone? Um. Maybe we'll try, maybe just try giving her a call. She was there a second ago. She's just dropped out again. There was um, two of her for a while. I'll give her. Has anybody else got a, a question they'd like to um, pose while um, Emma's doing this? Come on. Come on, Ali. I can't ask Carly any more questions. <laughs> But I reckon um, Charmaine must have a question. How about that? I guess. <laughs> For people who are unaware, Kelly is my oh, amazing so thesis supervisor. No. <laughs> <laughs> I am. I don't mean no in that sense. Well, I'm just looking. There's so many cool people on this chat. There's got to be some great questions. There's Macarena. <laughs> you are normally first with questions, Macarena, surely. <laughs> It's a very good crowd. We do have a um, a question here. Um, it's just turned up in the chat. Um, but I've got Lawata on speaker, but I don't know if anyone will be able to hear her, but we can try. Okay. So um, I'm afraid I don't know how to pronounce your name. Um, I, oh. Aoife. Aoife, yes. Sorry, that's so embarrassing. Aoife, I'm very embarrassed about that, but would you like to ask your question, please? No I was laughing from the moment that you, uh, you oh, I could see your face starting to change and I knew that's it. <laughs> I think once upon a time, I did used to know how to pronounce your name and it just evaporated in my head. <laughs> Sorry, don't worry, very strange. Um, yeah, so it was just something from the start. Can anyone hear me? Yes. Yes. Great. Okay, well, I think Aoife's got a question for both for, Lo, for both Loata and Carly. So let's let's go to that. Yeah, it was something that Loata mentioned at the start, um, which I think is just it was just a one liner, but it's such a huge topic. Um, you said that you know you were working in in the role of not just an architect but a facilitator, and um, I. I think I've described a few times to people what an architect does as being a facilitator. And I like to think that that's our job always, um, regardless of, of, you know, the project. Obviously it's, it's kind of undermined uh, the less involvement we have depending on the kind of contractual setup. But um, do either of you have, have kind of thoughts on how architecture can reclaim that role, like the fullness of, <laughs> the architectural role as being a facilitator for the whole project uh, compared to what a lot of people see it as now. Is Luata back? Yes. Luata, <laughs> go. Oh my gosh. Can you repeat your question, please? <laughs> sure. Sorry, I'll try and be more concise. Um, so it's accentuated, obviously, when you're working. Hello? Can you hear me? Oh. <laughs> oh. I'm gonna, I'm gonna call her and I'll ask my video. Okay. Can anyone hear me? 
Yes. yes. We can hear you. We can hear you. Hello. Hello. Can you hear us? <laughs> Hello. Okay. I'm going to ask you the question on the phone. <laughs> okay. 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 <laughs> um, so Aoife said, um, when you mentioned that you were working in the context of not just the architect, but a facilitator, um, she was wondering if um, you could elaborate on whether you have any thoughts about how this shift in perception could be made permanently. Hang on, I'm going to put you on speaker if you're gone from there. Okay. Can they, can you hear the water? Everyone, speak. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, your role of facilitation. Um, I guess, I guess for uh, like, um, um, I guess understanding the context uh, is the first process that you need to go in as as a as a professional, and I, I guess uh, uh, facilitation comes with the. Uh, a process of uh, also um, uh, trying to uh, get yourself, um, you know, how, how we come in uh, to a community, that, that perception is going to be there. But I, 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 like you said, it's a permanent thing, but I, I, I don't think you can have it a permanent thing because every context is different. And so your, your process, it, it, it would depend on your process, you as an individual. Um, and how you uh, um, how you allow yourself to engage with the community. Like my process for me, going back into my community, I had to go through a process of um, decolonizing myself as, 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 as a professional. You know, I, I'm not decolonizing my community. I'm decolonizing myself. So in my process of self-determination. So it has to be a self-determining process for the professional as they go into these sorts of contexts because they have to try and uh, understand the context and the people uh, that they will be working with. And through that, you'll be able to then develop your own process of facilitation. Yeah. That's, that's what I, 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 I think. And, and I think it's worked for me. And also your sense of, um, as an architect, uh, uh, observing the, your, the, the environment that you are working with me. You know, like sometimes um, it's our sense of observation, uh, our listening skills. Um, and sometimes uh, you feel like, okay, I have to do this this way, but sometimes it doesn't work that way because, um, that's not the way uh, the community that you're working with works. So you just have to go in and just try it. Like, just like what Carly said, uh, when she went in, she had to um, go in for a while before she had to uh, be able to have a contact with the women. And that's the same thing that I felt when I was, uh, when the first time I entered into the village, uh, it took me a while. I was, I was trying to force myself onto the community but it didn't work. I thought it would work because I was from the community. I, 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 so I, I look at it as kind of like your assumed perception and the, uh, the, the, the real, uh, the reality of what's on the ground. So I guess um, a permanent thing, I, I don't think you'd be able to get a permanent thing. I think it's, it's kind of like a process and each one of us and we'll have to find that process in how, how you engage with the community that you work with, especially with projects, like community projects. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks, Lawata. Thank you. What do you think? Hey, so we tried the breakout rooms. Yes. Everybody? Um, so um, for those of you who were here for the last... Um, Salon, we're trying to sort of replicate that chat that we have afterwards where everyone stands around with, you know, something to drink and something to eat and has a, has a chat. Um, of course, um, you know, we all, so what we are going to do is um, 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 autumn, uh, sort of randomly um, divide you into groups. Um, 
we hope that some of uh, we understand that not everyone will want to do this, um, but it really worked went quite well last time. We had a great time. We sort of everyone really got to meet someone I didn't know before. I think some um, new friendships might have just might have started. Some old friendships got rekindled. So um, you know, if you're completely freaked out about the idea of turning up in a Zoom room with people you don't know that's fine and we really thank you for coming and you're very welcome to um to go back to your life <laughs> but um if you would like to stay we would love it if you did um and i think what we're going to do is have a sort of 15 minute session and then we'll bring everyone back into the sort of main room and then we'll send everyone out for another 15 minutes with someone else with another group of people but before we do that, I just wanted to um, tell you about a couple of things that Parla's got on. So tomorrow we've got um, our usual Friday lunchtime session, Light at the End of the Tunnel. Um, and this week it's called Finding Opportunity. And it's with Kim Baisley, who's here tonight. I was very happy to see Kim. And Tanya Davidge. Um, again, a kind of fairly informal Q&A type session, of a different format. But um, they've been really successful. So we hope some of you might come along to that tomorrow um, and you've probably all been being flooded with endless emails from me um, about the survey that we're running um, which I do hope you've all done and I know it's long because I wrote it it's really long <laughs> it took me a really long time to write um, but it's been we think it's going to provide some really valuable data um, we've got 1800 responses so far so we're very happy about that Jill my colleague who's also here is going to be doing a whole lot of data crunching um, but if you haven't done it please do try and make time and we're also uh, we've got a bit of a gender balance problem we've got a lot of women done it um, we've had an increasing number of men taking that survey but we would like more so try and strong arm the men in your architectural lives into taking it um, um, unfortunately, um, SurveyMonkey is actually going to be down tomorrow morning, so I'm exhorting you to take the survey, but you won't be able to do it until um, Friday afternoon um, and if you don't do it tonight. And so as a result, we're also going to keep it open until Saturday. Um, and I hopefully next week we won't bombard you with quite as many emails as we have this week. But um, thank you all for coming. Um, it's really lovely to sort of see that wonderful... Um, um, mosaic of people and um, um, Kelly says she's not freaked out by the chat rooms but she's leaving anyway <laughs> anyway um, so the lovely hope from Monash I believe is going to magically pop us all into some chat rooms so just, I just wanted to say quickly thank you to Carly and Loata. I don't think I said thank you at the end. Sorry. No. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> a really long week. I'm so sorry. Carly and Loata, thank you so much. And I wanted to say too that um, both of you, I sort of, Carly, I felt you've always been out there with Paula and I, but I haven't really got to know you. And so I'm very happy. And, and Loata, I've recently. Um, that we've just published something and so I'm very happy that um, Loata is being drawn into the world of parlor um, and it was a very generous conversation and we really really appreciated it and I'm so sorry I forgot to say thank you. <laughs> thank you for having us. Thank you for having us.